Welcome to the Pomerantz Mentor Vignettes, sponsored by ProScan MRI Education Foundation. And today, we're still on the hip, connecting with our prior discussion, our labral primer in Vignette 6, now with femoral acetabular impingement type 1, or FAI 1. This 40-something ultra marathoner who runs between 30 and 100 miles per day in training, demonstrates two of the hallmark features of FAI. One, a wide femoral neck that doesn't gently taper. The neck is too wide, and thus the term loss of femoral head sphericity has come to be associated with FAI-1. The neck is fatter and thicker on the right than left, even though the patient is similarly affected on both sides. The second finding is the insufficient coverage, the horizontal upward sloping nature of the acetabulum that does not cover sufficiently the remainder of the femoral head on the right, nor does it do so on the left, but it's more severe on the right than left. This water-emphasized proton density fast spinecco image shows a segment of normal hyaline cartilage that includes both femoral and acetabular cartilage. The typical intermediate signal is visible, but where the proteoglycan and glycosaminoglycan is lost, the signal becomes higher in the back as a broad ulcer, a so-called contra-coup injury, way posterior to where the onset of pressure is actually generated, and that is in the front. The pressure is generated here, especially in knee flexion and in internal, worse than external rotation. The patient also has a hyperintense labral tear, this white thorn representing the tear, and some inhomogeneous signal replacing the normal gray areas of hyaline cartilage, producing what's known as a marginal erosion or inside-out abrasion seen with a white arrow. Now, a new technique that's used to assess both quantitative and qualitative the hyaline cartilage in the hip with impingement syndrome is called D. gameric, delayed gadolinium enhancement of cartilage. The gadolinium has a negative charge, minus two. The glycosaminoglycan within the cartilage also has a negative charge. When two structures or two substances both have the same negative or positive charge, what do they do? They repel each other. So the normal enhancement of the hyaline cartilage in a healthy joint should be scant. The gadolinium and the glycose aminoglycan should repel each other. The healthier tissues should be the ones that are cold that should not take up the gadolinium. Here's an axial T2 weighted MR showing some subtle irregularity and perhaps a little hyperintensity with a subcortical pseudocyst. But the true scope and nature of the hyaline cartilage disease cannot really be ascertained until one looks at the degameric examination with intravenous contrast injected and seeing the avidity of the gadolinium for most of the cartilage throughout. This avidity indicates marked depletion of the gag or glycosaminoglycan content of the cartilage, allowing the gadolinium to diffuse inward. So even though the cartilage is not as thin as you would expect, it's very, very sick chemically. Arthroscopically, we see what the surgeon might see, some irregularity and some ulcers, which are awfully shallow and can make the diagnosis of labral and hyaline cartilage pathology extremely challenging. Look at the gentle scuffing and fraying that may sometimes produce symptomatic change in the hip and how subtle it is even to the naked eye. Here's an example of a patient with FAI1 or CAM type impingement. 
one of the first things to happen with this loss of sphericity of the femoral neck, the lack of tapering, which sometimes may even be convex outward, is a labral tear with change in the hyaline cartilage. Look at the alteration in the signal of the hyaline cartilage as we move from medial to lateral. Returns just a bit grayer. We see a spur and a small, subtle osteoedematous stress reaction with a macerated labrum that looks swollen. It doesn't maintain or generate its normal, triangular, relatively homogeneous dark signal intensity on this pulsing sequence. There's some inflammation in the joint, and here is our ligamentum teres. This axial projection shows another cardinal feature of many types of cam impingement, not all. The bump cyst complex. In the axial projection, there is a slight bump at this location. Beneath it is a pseudocyst, a non-communicating bony pseudocyst that is surrounded by fibrous tissue, not epithelial tissue. And above it, a little bit of capsular fluid. There's also a labral tear that's hard to appreciate on this sequence. The coronal projection demonstrates the loss of tapering of the neck. Here's a little bit of tapering. Here's no tapering. And when that tapering becomes very unexaggerated or convex outward, we sometimes refer to that as the pistol grip deformity. There's another example of a subtle bump cyst complex. There's the pseudocyst, non epithelial line, intraskeletal pseudocyst with swelling above. On the T2 axial image, one can subtly see the bump. There is the pseudocyst. There's a little capsular fluid and there's a small amount of fluid throughout the joint. This small pit has been referred to as a pit's pit. In the past, it was given all kinds of names, but it is no different histologically than any of the other non-epithelial lined intraosseous ganglia that you see throughout the rest of the body that are induced by repetitive impaction and friction. Let's go back to our 40-something ultra long distance marathon runner who's the son of a radiologist. Even though he has FAI on both sides, he's symptomatic on the right. The lack of coverage of the femoral head is obvious. The wide, broad, non-tapered femoral neck with loss of sphericity is obvious. There's inflammation bilaterally in the supralateral capsule. He's a very muscular man with a paucity of fat based on his sport. A magnified, water-emphasized image shows the acetabulum, which has hypertrophied, is broken. The so-called FAI ossicle. Often, this was thought to be a developmental abnormality, but many of these are simply acquired fractures that occur anterosuperiorly from the mechanical forces that are generated in this syndrome. There's an erosion of the femoral head that demonstrates a stress reaction. The capsule is swollen. The capsule is floppy and distended. The supralateral capsule is swollen with a small cyst forming along its lateral margin. And on the contralateral asymptomatic side, the same findings are evolving, including a small extraarticular paralabral pseudocyst. Now, an important lookalike in FAI is an osteoid osteoma. These tend to occur in younger individuals, and around the hip, they are notorious for not generating intramedullary spongy bone edema. So you can be easily fooled, but the tip off is that the person is usually younger. They do not have lack of tapering of the femoral neck. They have a normal, graceful, tapered femoral neck. The abnormality is cortical, sometimes right under the cortex, but usually cortical. 
and it's not as bright as the bump cyst or pseudo cyst complex of FAI. For it's not water, it's an osteoid osteoma with anitis. And on the T1 weighted image, in no way does it resemble water. It has a signal that is much closer to that of muscular tissue. So beware of this pitfall, especially with the epidemic of FAI diagnoses that we see today in athletic young individuals. Look at how similar our intracortical nidus of osteoid osteoma looks, even in location, along the femoral neck on the T2 weighted image and on the proton density fat suppression image with the other bump cyst complexes you have seen. But it's not really a cyst, is it? It's not a nice, smooth, round structure with a rim to it and with pure or proteinaceous water in the center. It's much more bland and intermediate in its character. Another look-alike for the classic form of femoroacetabular impingement type 1, also known as CAM type impingement, is secondary impingement. The most common cause of secondary impingement is osteoarthritis. Anything that gives you a bump in that location can give you impingement, discomfort, when the leg is brought up in flexion and then internally rotated. We see osteoarthritic spurs in this region all the time. Here's an example. The patient has a largish femoral head. This is how they were born. It was dysplastic, a little too big for the acetabular cup. It's partially uncovered by the acetabular roof. This large spur contributes to abutment and restriction of motion every time the patient brings the leg up and in, and also in external rotation. A large area of scar tissue and blood has pervaded the femoral capsule, creating this large mass-like structure as a result of mechanical difficulty. Here in the axial projection, a small, very delicate slit-like tear is seen in the posterior labrum. An example of developmental dysplasia of the hip, or delayed onset dysplasia later in life resulting in osteoarthritis that together cohabitate and result in femoroacetabular impingement. So this concludes our discussion of, of FAI1, CAM type impingement. In the classic setting, it is the femur and its lack of tapering or even convexity or even a bump that contributes to the resultant problems that include perhaps a broken ossicle, but most importantly, a labral tear anteriorly, an erosion, a marginal erosion or abrasion of the anterior portion of the hip, other secondary erosions in the rest of the joint space. And as you saw with contrast, the entire joint space and its chemical makeup can be secondarily affected by this process. Thank you, and we'll see you on the next vignette.